His latest book is called How the Word is Passed. It takes us on this journey of monuments and slave ground, enslaved places where, where our ancestors were, landmarks and places like Monticello and others. And um, let me welcome back the great Clint Smith the third. Hey. It's so good to be here with you. Good to see you. Good to see you. And, and congratulations, man. I, I was reading this book and I said, well, well I kept saying, this brother can write. You know, <laughs> you know, there are people that put books together and you know, the information's good, but you know, it's it's clunky, it's you know, it's repetitive, it's you know, people are trying to show off their their vocabulary, you know, and I I'm I'm an avid reader, so I'm always I'm gonna read it. You know, but then I got my my left eyebrow up. This was a joy from the opening, from the epilogue, and uh, from the prologue. Excuse me, from the prologue. Just the 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 way that you describe the Mississippi River stretching out like a song. I was like, what? <laughs> the river is still in the windless afternoon. Its water a yellowish brown from the sediment it carried across thousands of miles of farmland cities and suburbs on its way south. And then you take us on a journey. What inspired this book, this one? Well, thank you so much again for having me and and, and thank you for those kind words. And, and I mean it because I think, um, I think oftentimes uh, Black writers don't always um, have the craft uh, of their work and the prose of their work engaged with. And it's always about, it's sort of an anthropological uh, experience in like, the, you know, let this black or brown or indigenous person sort of uh, give the reader insight into a world or lives they don't know. And, and you know, there is a, a space and a role and I hope that my book can be used as a pedagogical tool. I hope that people learn from it, but but I do, I don't take for granted um, the, the care uh, uh, of uh, what it means to, you know, be be told that, that the writing is, uh, is moving because that means a lot to me. Um, so, so I should say that first. Uh, so this book began in May of 2017 uh, when I watched the statues of Robert E. Lee, uh, Confederate General, Jefferson Davis Confederate President, P.G.D. Beauregard Confederate General, uh, among some other symbols of white supremacy, come down in my hometown of New Orleans. Uh, and so I was born and raised in New Orleans, and I was watching these monuments come down in 2017. And this is two years after Dylan Roof killed uh, those nine people in the church in South Carolina. And our uh, country had its own, you know, it, that that iteration, because um, I feel like we've sort of ebbed and flowed in our, our racial reckonings um, over the past several years. But a lot of people were, uh, that was the first wave of, of folks taking down Confederate monuments and ruling Confederate flags. And, and so it took two years for New Orleans to remove these statues, but they did. And so I was sitting at my home in Maryland, and I was watching these statues come down. And I was thinking about what it meant that I grew up in a majority Black city in which there were more homages to enslavers than there were to enslaved people. And, and how does that happen? And like, what does it mean that on the way to school, I went down Robert E. Lee Boulevard to get to the grocery store, I went down Jefferson Davis Highway to uh, that my middle school was named after a, a leader in the Confederacy, that my parents live on a street named after somebody who owned 150 enslaved people, that when I went to on field trips to plantations as an elementary school student, I would go on these tours where nobody even said the word slavery. And so part of what I'm thinking about are, you know, the fact that memorials and monuments and names of streets and buildings are not just symbols, but they are reflective of stories that people tell. And those stories embed themselves into narratives that societies carry. And those narratives shape public policy and public policy shapes the material conditions of people's lives. And so it's not to say that taking down a statue of Robert E. Lee is going to reduce the racial wealth gap, but it is to say it is part of a, a much larger, larger ecosystem and a larger project of white supremacy that that has its tentacles in every part of our society. And so I was watching these statues come down and I was thinking about that. And I was like, well, how is New Orleans reckoning with or failing to reckon with its own relationship to the history of slavery? And then I started thinking about that more broadly, like, well, how does this country and how different parts of this country reckon with or fail to reckon with their relationship to the history of slavery? And how do some places abroad do? And so I started going on this journey and I went to uh, dozens of places across the country uh, and ended up writing about eight of them and, and really wanted to capture, uh, have the book capture the uh, heterogeneity and the diversity of experiences and memories that are embedded in, in the soil of this country, right? That this country is a patchwork 
of memories and and the way that slavery is understood and remembered throughout this country very much depends on where you go and depends on who's telling that story mm. and depends on how that story is told and so hopefully i you know i wanted the book to be a quilt of sorts um in which you know at each place you see uh, a version of how this story is told uh, whether it be good or bad and quilts for those enslaved was a way that stories were told, was mm. a way to direct people along the Underground Railroad. Quilting in our tradition uh, is very powerful so that you use the book in the same way speaks to the ancestors speaking to you. We're with Clint Smith III. Um, you take us to Mississippi. Take us to Mississippi. Was that the most profound place? Because I think of Mississippi, you think of, you know, you've heard these things, you know, you, you get sent down you know you get sent down a river when you were uh sold and mm. you were misbehaving mm. you know you either get sent to the caribbean or you get sent down the mississippi is one of those harsh places that people from virginia got sent to that people yeah. from you know uh upper upper south got sent to because it was brutal yeah what so, did you what did you see there so i i took the uh the book begins in new orleans as you say um and part of what i'm doing in that moment is is looking at the mississippi river and thinking about, you know, we think all the time about the transatlantic slave trade, and and rightfully so, you know, millions and millions of people uh, were uh, brought forcibly from from Africa to different parts of of the Western world. But some we don't often think about the sort of second stop or the second sort of uh, uh, slave trade or the the way that it wasn't only just across an ocean, but it was across a country. And to your point, right, it was another part of the slave trade with the millions of people who were moved from Virginia to Mississippi, from uh, South, from North Carolina to, uh, to Texas, from uh, Maryland to Alabama, right? And that the, the deep South represented its own iteration of a sort of next journey um, of, of what that looked like. And, and I wanted to, and that's why I spend, I, I spend particular or pay particular attention to Louisiana in that. Um, and, and one of the places that I go is uh, Angola prison. Uh, and Angola, for those who don't know, is one of the largest maximum, it is the largest maximum security prison in the country. Uh, it is 18,000 acres wide, bigger than the island of Manhattan. It is a place where 75% of the people held there are black men, over 70% of them are serving life sentences. And it is built on top of land that was once a plantation. And what I tell folks is that if you were to go to Germany, and you had the largest maximum security prison in Germany, and it was built on top of a former concentration camp, in which the people held there were disproportionately Jewish, that place would be a global emblem of anti-Semitism. And rightfully so, it would be abhorrent, it would be disgusting, it would run counter to all of our moral and ethical sensibilities. And we would, people would be protesting outside of it every day because it would so clearly be, be dis, like, it would be disgusting that you would have a prison that incarcerates predominantly Jewish people on land that was once a concentration camp. And yet here in the United States, we have the largest maximum security prison in the country, in which the vast majority of people held there are black men serving life sentences who go out into fields of, was what, of what was once a plantation and work for virtually no pay while someone watches over them on horseback with a gun over their shoulder. And so part of what I'm wondering when I go to a place like Angola is like, what are the ways that white supremacy and the history of white supremacy both enacts physical violence against people's bodies, but also collectively numbs us? to certain types of violence that, that in another global context would be wildly unacceptable. And what does it mean that Angola not only fails to directly address or engage with or interrogate their relationship to that history, but that that place has a gift shop uh, and that at that gift what? shop, that, so the prison, uh, Angola prison, the Louisiana State Penitentiary, it has attached to it uh, or in front of it, a museum, the Angola Museum, uh, in which it doesn't at all mention slavery, um, but what it does have is a wall, a room dedicated to the rodeo that's held there. What it does have is a wall um, that shows all of the movies that have been filmed there. Um, what it does have is a sort of uh, uh, homage to all of the wardens who have, uh, who have worked there, but says nothing about the uh, institution that existed on that land that is unsettlingly parallel to what's happening on that land today. And, and attached to that museum is a gift shop where it sells shot glasses, uh, coffee mugs, um, uh, baseball caps, sweatshirts. And so, 
you have, you know, one of the most unsettling things I saw was there's a coffee mug um, and it has the silhouette of a watchtower on it. And in the watchtower, you can see the little guard at the top and you can see the silhouette of their gun. And above and below the silhouette of this watchtower, it says on this coffee mug, Angola, a gated community. And so, wow. again, you have this place that's not at all confronting or addressing their relationship to this history, but not only that, it is making a mockery of and, and belittling the experience of thousands of people who continue to be held in that prison, many of whom are there for things they did as children, many of whom who were sentenced by non-unanimous juries, uh, which were, have been, now been rendered unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. And so, you know, you go to Germany and I have not been personally, but from my understanding, like the, you know, Auschwitz and some of these death camps, like they have museums and they have restaurants and they have gift shops, but like one, they, I, to the, my understanding, they are tastefully and thoughtfully done. Two, uh, the museums directly address what happened in that place. And then three, there aren't people who continue to still be held there when you're going into this gift shop, right? And so, you know, Angola was a, I could have written a whole book about just Angola, um, but it was, it was, it was telling. Um, and it was place, you know, when we think of places, when we think of a spectrum of places that represent, like, are you being honest about your history? Are you not? Um, you know, Angola is it's on, on its own, sort of own end of the spectrum uh, in that regard. The book is How the Word is Passed, which, you know, as a poet, I, I, I was like, OK, I see what he's doing. <laughs> All right. He's about to do some stuff here. Clint Smith III is here. Why do you think there is this numbness and this disconnect? Because it's not just among white folk. Mm -hmm. you, you know, Black people, we've shown that we know how to be outraged and to mm -hmm. make the people aware of something. Why is there silence around this? Is that a vestige of the system of enslavement where, you know, uh, part of the survival is to kind of numb and, and, mm. and forget and to stuff down in this country? This 13th Amendment mm -hmm. flies in the face. It, it has a butt clause mm -hmm. making a provision for slavery, which we're seeing play out in Angola and other prisons across this country. We incarcerate more people than any other nation, and they're mostly black. That is not an accident. It's by design, but there's no outrage that, you know, in, in pockets, but not what like we saw last summer, mm. which to me, George Floyd was definitely representative of something. But Angola speaks to a to a history that we should all like want to overturn right now. Why, why do you think there's this pushback or this lack of action? With Angola specifically? Yeah. Or that, yeah. I mean... I think that part of the project of contemporary incarceration is to remove people from society and to make it seem as if they deserve or, or, or and or are singularly responsible for the things that they did or were charged of doing that put them behind bars. And so I think, I think a lot of times about this James Baldwin essay um, uh, called A Talk to Teachers. And it's a 1963, uh, it's based on a 1963 speech that he gave um, to a group of New York City educators. And, and I think it was published in 1964. And, and in it, you know, he says a lot of brilliant things. He's Baldwin. But one of the things that he says is that Black children are told over and over and over again by this world that they are criminal. But the role of the teacher and he's speaking to teachers literally, but also using teacher as a sort of literary metonym for the larger society. He's saying the role of the teacher is to help that black child understand that although the world tells them that they are criminal, it is in fact the society that created the conditions and the history that created the conditions that that child is growing up in that is the criminal. And, and for many of us, that's like a very simple and intuitive framework, but I think we can take for granted the extent to which so many of our young people, especially um, who, who grow up to be older people who carry the same sentiment, um, to the extent to which they internalize the idea that the reason their community looks their way, or the reason so many people end up in prison, or the reason so many people live in poverty, or the reason that there's so much violence is because it is somehow their fault, or something that they deserve. And I think that that's part of the insidiousness of, of the project of white supremacy is that it makes you 
you know, think that the reason one community looks one way and another community looks another way is because of the people in those communities and not because of what has been done to those communities generation after generation after generation. And so in the context of prison, I mean, I think about my own, uh, so I teach in prison and, and jails and prisons um, and have been doing so for the last seven years uh, and, and most recently been teaching at DC jail, uh, though I haven't been in in a while uh, because, of, because of COVID. But I think about uh, a moment where one of my students was, uh, he picked up the book by Richard Rothstein, The Color of Law. And uh, that book is about the history of housing segregation and really distills how state sanctioned housing segregation prevented black people from accumulating wealth, which prevented them from having the, the sort of upward mobility that their white counterparts did. And one of my students was reading this, and this wasn't even a book that we were reading together. He picked it up off the shelf, and then we were discussing it uh, because, because I really uh, enjoy and, and often recommend that book. And, and he was like, Smith, like, nobody ever taught me this. Like, nobody ever taught us this in school. And he was reading this book that helps to explain why his community looks the way that it does and helps him understand that the reason his community in DC looks the way that it does is not simply because people in his community are lazy. It's not simply because people in his community don't work hard enough. It's not simply because, it's not at all because people in his community are disproportionately uh, inclined toward violence or anything like that. It is because of a series of state sanctioned decisions that were taking place long before he was even born that shape what his community looked like. And that, and that can't be disentangled from the fact that he ends up in prison. Because what we know about people who end up in prison is that they're disproportionately coming from poor communities and that they're disproportionately coming from communities that are saturated with violence. Um, and again, th that poverty and violence doesn't just arise out of nowhere. It's the result of a desperation it's the result of uh, a lack of resources and a lack of social infrastructure that is the result of specific decisions that people have made or failed to make to invest or disinvest from certain communities. And so that's a long way of saying that I think that sometimes we have a hard time connecting the dots and we are inundated with messages from our media, from our movies, from our television that like if you're if you end up in prison, you did, you know, that's on you, you did something bad or at, at worst, like that it's a sort of rite of passage, that it's a sort of mm. inevitable part of what it means to be a young black man, especially um, in this uh, in this world. And part of what I think studying history can do, and part of what I hope this book can do, is help people understand that like the reason our society and that our country looks the way that it does is because of things that have been done um, and that continued to be done long before so many folks were even born. Clint Smith III, the book is How the Word is Passed. As I'm listening to you, I'm also frustrated because the people who might need to read this book probably aren't going to pick it up. Mm. There's a movement in this country against knowledge, <laughs> against mm. teaching history, whole history, complete history. And so they are covering their ears and their eyes and their passing laws and they're talking about critical race theory mm -hmm. and they're talking about not teaching white children to feel bad mm -hmm. and so we are here but there's a, a willful pushback to actually understanding how we got here how do we combat that i get the internalized mm -hmm. you know self-hatred but this outside force that won't even teach everybody and i think about jane elliott and what she did which was so courageous in iowa all white on the heels of martin luther king being dead that she forced her students to understand racism in america all mm. white children she did that mm. and she's still doing it you know she's in her 80s mm -hmm. but we we have very few jane elliott's in this world you know i think that I think there's a lot of teachers, you know, I, I was a high school English teacher for a few years before I started graduate school and started writing full time. Um, and I still, you know, see and engage with a lot of teachers, um, all because teaching is, you know, is so I thought I was gonna be a high school English teacher for like 40 years. I mean, I, I loved it. There, to me, there's nothing better than sitting with a group of 15 year olds talking about a novel and, and just like, um, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I miss that. I miss that time. Um, but there, I do think that there are a lot of teachers who uh, have, who have all, you know, many teachers, uh, especially many black teachers who have um, been teaching and attempting to teach this history. Um, I think there are more teachers even now, especially since last summer, um, who recognize that a sort of 
critical pedagogy and an anti-racist pedagogy is necessary and must be embedded into their sort of larger curriculum um, if they are to help their students understand why the world looks the way that it does today. And, well, and but what about the predominantly white? I mean, you know, I, I know black, teach, black yeah. teachers are doing it, but, but, you know, most of the schools in this country are segregated. I think about New York City, one of the most diverse cities in the country, very segregated. You have schools that are 99% white, 99% black and Hispanic in New York City, which is so diverse. And so you have teachers that, you know, and now there's these edicts across the country in these yeah. uh, states like, like Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, that are saying, no, nah, you can't teach the 1619 or yeah. any vestige of any history that doesn't start with George Washington being the father of this nation and being great. Right. No. And I think it's something that is real and something that we need to be concerned about. Um, and and it is meant to have a chilling effect. It is meant to further disincentivize and, and frankly, scare teachers, black and white alike, um, from from engaging and teaching this history for fear of like what they, um, you know, of being fired or getting a complaint or, or getting in trouble with the administration or some parents. And this is reflective of something, I mean, we see it going on right now. And, you know, that's because there is an entire political party that is predicated upon uh, a culture of fear that is predicated upon, you know, that has no policy agenda and that is attempting to use culture wars as the currency that they, uh, that is the political currency with which they operate. And because they know that if young people understand that the history of this country is inextricably linked to slavery, to native genocide, to the way that we treated so many immigrant groups uh, when they first arrived on these shores, then it shatters the myth of this country. It shatters the myth of meritocracy. It shatters the idea that America is a place that uh, all you have to do is work hard and you can get everything that you need. Um, it shatters the story that they have about themselves and the reason that they believe they have the things that they do or the reason that they think they should have certain things um, at the expense of others. It, it completely allows that to crumble because you realize that the entire social, political and economic infrastructure of this country is born of and is a vestige of slavery. And part of what I want to do, I try to do in this book is like really help us understand our proximity to this history. Because the way that we're taught about slavery, I remember the way that I was taught about slavery, I was made to feel like it's this thing that was in like the Jurassic Age, right? It was like the dinosaurs, the Flintstones and slavery. Like they all existed at the same time. And, and the reality is that if we're going to think about, you know, 1619 as being the beginning of slavery in the British American colonies um, that would become the United States and ending in 1865, we had slavery for, uh, for almost 250 years in this country and have only not had it for about 150. So we had slavery in this country for two, for a hundred years longer than we haven't. The woman who opened the museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture who stood alongside the Obama family in 2016 to signal the opening of this museum was the daughter of an enslaved person, not the granddaughter, not the great granddaughter. She was the daughter of someone who had been born into intergenerational chattel slavery. My grandfather, his grandfather is someone who was born into bondage. So when my four-year-old son sits on my grandfather's lap, I imagine my grandfather sitting on his grandfather's lap. And I'm reminded that Again, this history we tell ourselves was a long time ago wasn't in fact that long ago at all. And so the idea that we would suggest that that period of time has nothing to do with what the contemporary landscape of inequality looks like is both morally and intellectually disingenuous. And, and the efforts to prevent teachers from teaching that and helping their students understand that is because when you realize our, our sort of temporal proximity uh, to that period of time, then again, it calls into question the entire narrative that we've been inundated with uh, about what this country is and, and who it has been. Um, and that undermines the sort of larger uh, policy foundation to the extent that there is one of, of an entire political party of this country. And so they, they want to make it feel, you know, like Nikki Haley said, you know, they're trying to teach our kids that they're racist. It's like, nobody's trying to teach your kids that they are racist. What, what they're, we're trying to teach your, your children and our students and, and this country is that it was created undeniably on a foundation and a bedrock of racism and that that continues to shape our systems and structures and policies today. 
Clint Smith the third, the book is how the word is passed. Tell me something about the Whitney Plantation. The Whitney Plantation is in Louisiana. Um, it is uh, the only plantation museum in Louisiana that uh, centers the lives of enslaved people rather than the people who enslaved them. Uh, and it is one of the only plantations in the country that does that. And it's it's interesting because it is a plantation that's almost surrounded by uh, a constellation of other plantations where people continue to hold weddings, where uh, people have, you know, celebrate the most joyous day of their life in the home of former enslavers, uh, where, you know, as some wedding planners told me, um, some people use the slave, the former slave cabins as bridal suites. And so the Whitney plantation is a place that rejects the idea that a plantation can be understood as anything other than an intergenerational site of torture. And that you must understand the plantation as a site of torture. Uh, or death camp. As, and, and, or, and death uh, camp. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also at the same time, understand that the people who were held in this place were human beings. Right. Um, and so they were held in, a, in an inhumane system, but they themselves were, were deeply human. Um, and so it's attempting to sort of hold those two realities at once. Uh, and, and I think that part of what it's also trying to do is push us to think about slavery, not through the per lens and perspective of the typical slave narratives that we hear, which are that of Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, Harriet Jacobs, a lot of Equiano, but to think about how slavery was a system that impacted millions of people whom folks like those four, for, like those four people are not necessarily reflective of the experience of most enslaved people. Like much, you know, Frederick Douglass wasn't even just, I mean, he's not like an exceptional enslaved person. That's just like an exceptional dude, right? Like they don't right. make them like, like people like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, they don't, they don't make people like that. Like there are not a lot of people like that in the history of the universe. Um, and so these are extraordinary, extraordinary individuals who did extraordinary, extraordinary things, which is why we're drawn to their stories. But I think, and it is important to study them and take them seriously because I think it, it, it shows uh, the possibilities, the, the possibilities of, of mm. what people can do and what resistance can look like. But also, I think it's important for our conception of re resistance and rebellion not to be limited to that type of, of framework, right? Because not everybody, very few enslaved people uh, were able to run away successfully. Very few enslaved people like Frederick Douglass writes about in his memoir, you know, fought their slave breaker uh, so that he wouldn't hit them anymore. The vast majority of enslaved people were, the, were individuals who were trying to carve out some semblance of a meaningful life in the, in the face of an omnipresent, ongoing, continuous spectacle of cruelty. And just to, to, and to find love and to build community and to create meaning in their lives in ways that in a system that we, could, we can't even imagine being a part of. And I think that that too is resistance. And that too are the stories that need to be lifted up and celebrated. And I think part of what the Whitney does is try to make sure that we're thinking about those stories, which is why they use the, the Federal Writers Project narratives, uh, which are these, um, is from this New Deal era project in which the narratives of uh, 2,300 formerly enslaved people uh, were collected at the end of the 1930s. Um, and these are people who were children in the era of slavery, because these stories reflect just the, the simple things that we can take for granted, like, you know, the, the stories of enslaved people dancing together on a Saturday night in a barn when they were done with their work. The story of like two enslaved people sort of, you know, trying to find a minute to hold one another's hand uh, while they were picking crops while the overseer looked away. Uh, you know, enslaved children like skipping rocks on the creek, these small moments of humanity that remind us that these people were not simply what was done to them, but that they were, that they were people. Um, and, and I appreciate that the Whitney um, tries to really make us see that. Yeah, uh, because many of us can't live up to the ex exceptional Negro, not even in America. Not every writer is going to be a Clint Smith. Not every basketball player or person that's an athlete is going to be a LeBron James. Uh, but, you know, we 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 are forced to live up to the exceptional Negro myth uh, when these are unique people, you know, and and and, and, and it's OK to not be LeBron or, or Clint. Absolutely. Smith. Eight, I mean, eight, six, six. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
No, I was going to say, well, one, that's very generous of you to put my name next to LeBron. I did that. Um, but, but part of what I was going to say is that it, it's also part of the, the insidia. It's like an intentional thing because systems of oppression have always relied on being able to point to exceptional people to justify an otherwise oppressive system, right? So you have to be able to point to Oprah or Michelle Obama or Barack Obama or whoever to say like, look, they made it or look what they did in order to suggest that everybody should be able to do those things, which is which is what oppressive systems all over the world, uh, that's how they operate. Uh, we're in a month where we have something called Juneteenth, a, a holiday that uh, will be celebrated here at Sirius XM for the first time this year. There we go. I didn't grow up knowing that there was such a thing as Juneteenth. Mm. I did not know about it. And I'm black. I've been black my whole life, lived with black people. My whole neighborhood was black. We didn't celebrate Juneteenth. I didn't know about it until I think I was in my 30s um late and you write you have a, a chapter about uh galveston island mm. what took you there yeah so i went to galveston um for juneteenth for the uh al edwards senior uh annual prayer breakfast and al edwards is the uh the late uh state senator state legislator out of uh texas who who was the person who uh brought the legislation up uh, and got the legislation passed that made Juneteenth a state holiday in, in Texas about 40 years ago. And so I, there's this breakfast every year, and it's at this place called Ashton Villa, which the sort of mythology of the place is that it, that is where the Union General, uh, General Granger, came and uh, made his announcement, uh, which called General, General Order Number 3, uh, that all slaves in Texas were free. And part of the context is that this was two months after General Lee General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox, um, effectively ending the Civil War. This was two years after the, Abraham Lincoln put out the Emancipation Proclamation. So you have 250,000 in, uh, enslaved people in Texas who continued to be enslaved after the Civil War was, was basically done and, and who will continue to be enslaved two years after Abraham Lincoln said that they should be free. Um, and it is this space where the descendants of people whose ancestors were freed by that general order, gather uh, and spend time together and reflect on, on what Juneteenth means. And there was this moment when I was there uh, where they were singing um, the Black National Anthem, the uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And, you know, same way I grew up around Black folks my whole life. And, and you know, I've heard that song in church, the community group at the yeah, Thanksgiving. I mean, you hear it all the time but I had never been so moved as, as I was hearing it in this space because it, it was that we were in this building, on this land, on this island, surrounded by people for whom the words of, of James, Weldon, James Weldon Johnson's poem turned song was not an abstract, a lyrical abstraction. It was, it was literal. I mean, we were standing on that land. We were uh, rem saying the words, they had they had union reenactors, um, white and black men dressed up in in union garb who who reenacted the entire uh, the the entire thing. And and so you know we we were standing there with these hundreds of black folks in this room and and other groups of people because I think a lot of folks in Galveston recognize that it, this is a holiday that is uh, central to the black American experience, but one that we should all celebrate. Um, and you have these group of people and they're all standing there and they're closing their eyes. And this man is, is set, like, he says, all slaves are free. And he repeats it. He's like, I repeat, all slaves are free. And people are shaking and people are crying and people are, again, remembering that their ancestors who, who are only a few generations removed from us were people who heard those words or read those words or were told about those words. Uh, and I think that part of what happens in Galveston is there's a an effort to both mourn the fact that there, that the people in Galveston, the people of Texas were prevented from knowing that they were free before uh, the, the Union Army came in to tell them, um, June 19th, 1865, and also celebrating the end of one of the worst things that our country has ever done, and celebrating not only the freedom, but celebrating the fact that millions and millions of enslaved people fought for that freedom and made that freedom possible even when they knew they wouldn't see it themselves 
And that's what I think of when I think of Juneteenth. I think of how slavery ended in 1865, but there were millions of enslaved people since the first moment that enslaved people were brought to these shores who were fighting for liberation, who were fighting for freedom, uh, who never got to see it, but who fought for it because they knew that somebody someday would. 